uh, Fox 13 uh, had an article, Fox 13 uh, in uh, Tennessee had an article, uh, four men kicked out of Wolf Chase Galleria for wearing hoodies, witness claims. And some of you probably saw this story. You may, it may have even seen the video of um, one African-American man being arrested, others being escorted out by the, uh, uh, by the police. And this was, this was at the mall. And the video was recorded by a former journalist named Kevin McKenzie. Kevin McKenzie was an African-American man. And um, he, the sort of video went viral, okay? And um, Kevin, McK Kevin McKenzie, uh, he felt that the men were being discriminated against, okay? And uh, the, the mall said that they violated the policy uh, of wearing appropriate clothing, okay? Now at the mall, they have a, 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 a long list of rules to follow, okay? And one of the rules, one of the first rules is that you have to wear appropriate clothing. But the, but the rules do not say you cannot wear hoodies, okay? And you have stores there, I'm pretty sure, that sell hoodies at the mall, all right? So the, so the video shows the man being escorted out of the mall. Kevin McKenzie said he noticed a white male security guard trailing some young men who appeared to have just come into the mall. Um, and he said uh, it was like, quote, he was a cat after mice, end quote, all right? Now he told, Kevin McKenzie told uh, uh, Fox 13 that he started to record what was going on because he didn't like the way that the African-American men were being treated. These were, they appeared to be teenagers if I remember correctly. Now the video shows a man being placed in handcuffs uh, and Kevin McKenzie said at least four men were racially profiled when he, asked security why the men were being removed from the mall, they told him it was because they were quote unquote wearing hoodies, according to Kevin McKenzie. Now, uh, Kevin said he never saw the men wearing the hoodies over their heads. Now, Fox Channel 13 reviewed the code of conduct policy for the mall, which states that people quote, must wear appropriate clothing, end quote, but there are no specifics about what type of clothing is banned, all right? So sometimes in malls, sometimes even in banks in certain areas, they have policies there. They'll ask you to remove your hat, remove your sunglasses, remove hoods, things like that. That's so that the cameras, security cameras, can actually get a clear uh, recording of your face in case you commit some type of criminal act, all right? But in this specific case here, it's not clear if it was explained to them why hoodies were not allowed, even though the code of conduct that's listed does not ban hoodies. It just says you have to wear appropriate clothing, but is but that's very vague. So Kevin, Kevin McKenzie um, said, uh, he, he said he was, as he himself was escorted off the property and arrested shortly afterwards for quote unquote, violating a mall rule, end quote. Now, the Wolf Chase Galleria Mall, that's the name of the mall, Wolf Chase Galleria Mall there in Memphis, Tennessee, sent a statement to Fox Channel 13. And they said, Wolf Chase Galleria is focused on providing a safe environment for all customers and employees. We require customers not to conceal their identity on mall property as a matter of public safety. It is important that our security cameras and security personnel be able to see the faces of everyone on property. Mall security personnel respectfully ask all customers concealing their identity to conform to the policy. Police are only called if a customer refuses or becomes belligerent in, in this instance, uh, uh, or belligerent. In this instance, a Memphis Police Department officer repeatedly requested the individual to remove his hoodie. He did not comply with this directive and was removed from the mall, okay? Now, here's, here's the problem. One, Kevin McKenzie said he did not see any of the men with the hoodies on their head, one. Two, even if they did have the hoodies on their head, in this statement here from 
Wolf Chase Galleria Mall, it does not say that the men were, it was explained to the men why they could not wear hoodies on their head. Now, I don't know if the officer actually explained to them, okay, uh, that, 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 is a, that is a policy so that security cameras and security personnel can be able to see the faces of everyone on the property. I don't know if that was explained to them, but don't you think if it was explained to them that Wolf Chase Galleria Mall would have put that in their official statement? They did not say it was explained to these African-American men why they could not wear hoodies on their heads. And Kevin McKenzie said he didn't see any of them with the hoodies on their heads. OK, so so that's 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 the article from Fox 13. All right. And they have a video. Um, uh, they have a video in this article as well. Fox 13 is a Memphis affiliate of uh, Fox News. OK, we'll post this link right here on the thread because this story because this story continues. OK, this story continues. Now, hopefully you all could hear me well on uh, on YouTube here and I'll go back and edit out the distorted portion. All right. OK, now. Um, a few days ago, you had four white women who who live uh, in the Memphis suburb of Cordova. They live in Cordova, Tennessee. They performed a social experiment. They went to the mall, the same mall, Galleria Mall, and they all had hoodies. Now, they, and it's, at, at certain points, they, what they did was they walked all around the mall wearing hoodies, okay? At a certain point, they put the hoodies on their head, all right? They were not arrested. Four white women. Here's what happened. Now, now AtlantaBlackStar.com has an article about this. They picked it up from Fox 13. OK. Tennessee Mall remains quiet after four white women called their bluff on alleged hoodie policy that left four black teens arrested. Four white women from the Memphis suburb of Cordova, Tennessee, conducted a social experiment after a group of African-American teenagers were targeted by Wolf, Wolf Chase Galleria's alleged no hoodie policy last week. Sherry Ennis, E-N-N-I-S, and her three friends saw the viral video captured by former journalist Kevin McKenzie of four young black men being thrown out of the Memphis Mall on November 3rd, 2018, for supposedly violating its code of conduct policy by wearing hoodies in the mall. One of the young men was even arrested within moments of the incident. Now, the women decided, these four white women decided to challenge the policy by wearing hoodies to the same mall to bring light to racial profile. Sherry Ennis, um, yeah, Sherry Ennis told Fox 13 that she and her friends walked around the mall with their hoodies, with their hoodies inside of the Galleria for more than a mile. At times, they placed the hoodies over their heads just to see what would happen. Sherry Ennis said, quote, we pulled them up on occasions and we were approached very politely and asked to remove them, that it was obscuring our, our identities, so we took them down, end quote. Now, Fox 13 contacted the mall to get their view on the women's social experiment. Quote, we are still waiting on, now, Fox 13 said, we are still waiting on the mall to explain why the women were not forced out of the store or out of the mall as the teenagers were, okay, end quote. And they have the video in this article, and we'll go to the original article from Fox 13, that the story is in there. And they're saying, wait a second, now, which, and, 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 and I went and researched this, I can't find a statement from Wolf Chase Galleria Mall about this incident here with the white woman. I found the statement, what happened after the African-American men were thrown out and what was arrested. I found a statement. I can't find one about, well, why weren't these white women thrown out? Okay. So the four African-American men were thrown out of the mall. Uh, never once wore their hoodies over their heads 
when they were told to leave, according to Kevin McKenzie, the journalist. All right. Um, let's. I, I want to go to the article here from Fox 13. So just a second. So um, November 14th, Fox 13 has this article. Four women wore banned hoodies inside mall to prove a point about racial profiling. Okay. And they have some of the statements here from um, Sherry Ennis. And she said, um, re regarding why she and her friends decided to do this experiment, she said, quote, it just stuck, it, it just struck a chord, uh, it just struck a chord on us that we could do that. We could walk through there, we could take pictures, we could wear whatever we wanted. Okay, um, well, that that's um, the response to what happened when they did the experiment. Okay, so um, so the code of conduct policy for the mall states people must wear appropriate clothing. It doesn't specify what type of clothing. However, uh, Sherry Ennis said there's even apparel sold in there, referring to the mall that a certain segment of society is not allowed to wear, end quote. Now, she and her friends said they walked more than a mile at the mall just to see what would happen if they wore hoodies. Um, and then you had some responses on social media um, as well. Let's see. She said that we, um, uh, Sherry Ennis went on to say, we pulled them up on occasions and we were approached very politely and asked to remove them, that it was obscuring our identity, so we took them down, end quote, okay? Now, Kevin McKenzie told Fox 13 that he, uh, okay, he never saw the African-American men with the hoodies. All right, so uh, in, in atlantablackstar.com, they were citing the article from Fox 13. So what's interesting here is that one, the white women were not thrown out, Two, they were not looked at as a threat. Three, Wolf Chase Gallery of Mall. Now, this article is from November 14th. The day is November 20th. Wolf Chase Gallery of Mall still has not put out a statement of why the white women weren't asked to leave, why none of them were arrested. But the African Americans were asked to leave and one was arrested. Okay. Now, there was an article from. Um, Commercial Appeal, commercialappeal.com, which is from November 6th. And they have a statement in there, but that statement is to the original incident. No, no response to the white women. I just find it interesting. Now, I'm happy. Now, you know, I don't know who these white women voted for. I don't know if they voted for Trump or what have you. I don't know. I'm happy they did this social experiment because they, they used their white privilege to really expose what's going on here and show the stark difference, okay? I hope they can talk to the 53% of white women who voted for Trump and the, and the, and the 75% of, uh, 75, about 75% of white women that voted for uh, Brian Kemp down in Georgia and, and the ones that voted for Ron DeSantis in, in Florida, you know, but I'm glad they did this experiment, okay? Because now, now so hopefully, um, the NAACP, National Urban League, hopefully civil rights organizations there in Memphis will get involved in this and put pressure on the mall, okay? And personally, you know, with Black Friday coming up, African-Americans may wanna think of boycotting that mall, withdrawing economic support from that mall because of the way they're treated. Because I remember in Dearborn, Michigan, back in about 90, 596, somewhere around there. I remember there was a boycott of Fair Lane Shopping Mall, which is in Dearborn, Michigan. Dearborn has a long history of racial uh, tension and, and racism towards African-Americans. But I, I remember there was an economic boycott launched by the NAACP because there were numerous incidences of African-American men being profiled at that mall, arrested, different things like this, right? Okay, so. How's everybody doing? Let's go to some of your uh, 
Let's go to some of your comments. And uh, African-American business owners, hey, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. Um, you can advertise with the African History Network. Email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com, customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. And uh, we put your 30 second and 60 second commercial into the audio podcast, audio podcast of our uh, Sunday night show, the African History Network show and some other broadcasts that we do. Okay, and each episode we reach thousands of people across the country uh, with each episode. Email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com for more information. We have a special promotion. Uh, you get the um, you get the first month 50% off and the second month free, okay? All right, so let's look at some of your comments here. We've got Moni J. I still don't shop at Fairlane to this day. Yeah, I haven't been to Dearborn. I can't remember the last time I've been to Dearborn, Michigan. And I do, I do not go to Fairlane Shopping Mall. I haven't been there in years, okay? Uh, Zanae, hope they sue. Yeah, I hope they do too. Um, they should, I hope they get legal representation. But I don't know if any civil rights organizations in that in Memphis have gotten involved, but they should get involved in this because there's a clear difference. OK, if they had. If, 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 now, I don't know if the police explain to the men, to the African-American men, why hoodies are not allowed or if they just exerted authority and said you can't wear hoodies. But in the statement from the mall, OK. And uh, we'll post the article here from um, Fox 13. In the, in the uh, official statement from the mall, they did not say in there that the police explained to the men why they could not wear hoodies, okay? A lot of this has to do with how you speak to people, how you approach people. Okay, yes, okay, uh, let's see here. Who else we have, okay. Zanae, Titan, uh, okay. So y'all post your comments here. All right, but this is a crazy, crazy story. We'll see what happens with it here. Um, but I, I, want, I want to see how this turns out. I want to see if, um, I want to see what the fallout is from this story, okay? All right, those in Detroit, I want to let you know that I will be at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History on Black Friday, Friday, November 23rd, 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. for the Black Friday Marketplace. We have a Black Friday Marketplace uh, taking place. Uh, it's free and open to the public. There'll be African-American vendors there. So this is an opportunity to redirect dollars to African-American-owned businesses. Redirect dollars to African-American-owned businesses. If you're gonna go to the shopping malls and spend your money with white corporations, things like that. At least come and spend some money with African-American-owned businesses first, okay? At least come and spend your money with African-American-owned businesses first. Um, we'll post a link here. We have it on our website, africanhistorynetwork.com. We'll post a link to the uh, information at the right.org. Uh, for the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. So those around the country who maybe ha have never been to the museum, that's the museum where Aretha Franklin's body lay in repose for two days before the funeral. We see people all around the country uh, uh, saw the footage of her body laying there. That's at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, okay? So um, we have the information at our website also, africanhistorynetwork.com, africanhistorynetwork.com. Okay, and that's Friday, 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, I was this past weekend dealing with economic empowerment. This past weekend, um, Saturday and Sunday, I was at uh, Hartford Memorial Baptist Church. Once again, they had a pre-Black Friday holiday bazaar. Okay, a pre-Black Friday holiday bazaar. And they had about 15 African-American-owned businesses. We were, we were one of them. But we had a vendor table. And it caused me to think, that um, there need, I think at every African-American church across the country, they should have what I call economic empowerment Sundays. Economic empowerment Sundays. And while I was there Sunday, I got to hear, um, you know, so we were in the lower level 
Uh, and this is like where they have, this is like where they have the eating area and they have a kitchen there, things like this. And they had a big screen and they showed the pastor's uh, sermon for that day, okay? So um, every, what I think should happen is that every first Sunday of the month in African-American churches, they should have um, African-American owned business. They should have vendors. They should have some type of African marketplace, African-American marketplace in the basement, what have you. And this is going on during the service. So then before service or after service, people can go and patronize these African-American owned businesses as a way to circulate dollars, empower African-American owned businesses, circulate dollars in our own communities, okay? And, and, and this is less expensive than all these businesses trying to get brick and mortar stores. Some of them may have a brick and mortar store. A lot of them don't because that's very expensive. But if you, if you have economic empowerment Sundays at African-American churches all across the country, the first Sunday. Now, why the first Sunday? <laughs> because <laughs> usually <laughs> in most African-American communities, they have more money at the first of the month than the end of the month. So you don't want to do it at the end of the month. <laughs> do it at the first of the month, okay? Um, and this could be a very low cost way. Now, it, it, it'll generate money for the, for the churches because people pay the vendor fee, $50, $75, whatever it is. This can generate money for the churches. This can help recycle African-American dollars right inside the churches as well. And this helps to empower African-American owned businesses also. Okay, economic, hashtag economic empowerment Sundays, first Sunday each month. And then um, I'm all for having a Black, a Black Friday marketplace, right? So we can spend our dollars with our businesses and redirect some of the dollars we spend with the corporations to our own businesses. But, but we should definitely do one of those at the beginning of, of, beginning of November when African-Americans have more money, okay? Because see, uh, I'll be at the Black Friday marketplace and I understand they're going through a lot of issues at the Charles H. Wright Museum. But one of the problems is, is that people go to the go to the shopping mall, spend their money, then come and bring what's left <laughs> to the to the African American owned vendors. If you do it on Black Friday, okay. But if you do it the first, if you do it the first Saturday or first Saturday and Sunday in November, now now we have more money. We can spend more money with our own businesses and do this across the country. Do this in churches across the country, okay? Economic Empowerment Sundays, all right? And then also have that Black Friday marketplace do one the first weekend of November. Do it Saturday and Sunday also. And then Kwanzaa is coming up. Now at this black at the at the Black Friday marketplaces, now you can you can also get your Kwanzaa gifts here as well, okay? But in, in my presentations dealing with Kwanzaa, I oftentimes show the um, my presentations dealing with Kwanzaa. I oftentimes show the um, video from um, her name is uh, Carrie Cadet. Carrie Cadet, and some of you may have seen this before. Carrie Cadet, and this is a um, what she did was she's a comedian from Brooklyn. And I first found out about this from AtlantaBlackStar.com. And what she wanted to do was to combine economic empowerment with Kwanzaa. And she said she wanted to introduce Kwanzaa to millennials and wanted to make Kwanzaa cool again. Okay. And what she what she did was she and two of her friends created a a Kwanzaa crawl, a Kwanzaa crawl. Okay. And what the Kwanzaa crawl did, uh, what they did was they organized about 1,600 people, 1,600 African-Americans in about two weeks, two, two and a half weeks. And the first day of Kwanzaa in 2016, they went and they targeted 17 African-American owned businesses. And they broke up into groups of about 100. And they went and spent money with these businesses. Now, 
on um, Kwanzaa in 2016, the first day fell on a Monday. First day is Umoja, dealing with unity. And they directed thousands of dollars to these businesses on this one day. And a lot of these businesses were normally closed on a Monday. And she called a Kwanzaa crawl. She did it again in 2017, and they were able to target more businesses. I think they targeted about 25, okay? But this is something that organize, African-American organizations across the country can organize for Kwanzaa. This is something churches can do if they want to, to get out and, and target African-American-owned businesses. I mean, do the, do the economic empowerment Sundays, but also you can take a, a bus trip, a bus tour to different businesses or organize and, 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 and go out and hit different businesses, okay? Um, so what she did, I mean, this was a really, really great story. New, New York Daily News had an article about this. AtlantaBlackStar.com picked up the article. She talked about how elected officials, she organized all, she and her friends organized all these people. And she talked about how elected officials came out. And she said, a lot of these elected officials, she said, she didn't know. She said, she said, you need to know who your Congress people are, know who your city council people are, things like this. She said, like the year before, she said the year before, she didn't know who all these people were. Okay. But she knows who, she knows who they are now. And she was able to mobilize all these people, which then also ties in to leveraging those people mobilized, right? Leverage, leveraging those people mobilized to push political agendas, to push political issues, to leverage our economics, to enforce our politics, which is something that Dr. Claude Anderson talks about. If you heard the interview I did with Dr. Claude Anderson, uh, October 28th, 2018 on my show, and then we put it here, or we have it here on YouTube. I think we uploaded it to YouTube. I think it's here. Okay, but we'll post this article here also, because I deal with this in some of my uh, lectures, uh, dealing with economic empowerment and Kwanzaa, things like this. These are practical strategies, okay? This is not, you know, I hear a whole bunch of nonsense. It's it just, it's okay, whatever. We need to do this, we need to do that, okay. We, these are practical strategies. Okay, that we can implement. We posted that article here. Um, refined by fire said, I go back to church if they implemented empowerment and history beyond the month of February. Okay. <laughs> now, I just spoke at Hartford Church um, late October 2018 because they had the, the social justice ministry. They do it each year, the social justice ministry conference. And I think this is my third or fourth year speaking there. This year's theme was dealing with um, the 50, commemorating the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. King and they've done with where do we go from here. So I did two workshops Saturday morning and Saturday morning did two workshops dealing with uh, the distortion of the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The revolutionary will not be televised on the television. Okay, that's what my presentation was on. We have that on DVD at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com also, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. So people learned a whole lot of history that day. Also dealt with the day Dr. King met Malcolm X, which was March 26, 1964. Uh, later in the same month that Malcolm officially separated from the Nation of Islam, okay? So, all right. Hey, if you like this type of information, you can donate to the African History Network, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal dot me forward slash the AHN show that helps us to stay on the air, keep doing the research, keep uh, helps us to finance the radio show that we do Sunday nights, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation. You can listen to the audio podcast of the shows also. We post them here, like this past Sunday show, we uh, is here on our YouTube channel, uh, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. We also have the audio podcast of the shows uh, at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Click on listen to podcasts. We're on six different podcast platforms, Blog Talk Radio, iTunes, CastBox, Acast, FM Player, TuneIn.com. Um, I'm trying to get us back on Stitcher, okay? And uh, so we're on six different podcast platforms. Email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, um, and you can, uh, 
can let you know how to advertise with us. We can get you up and running today. And Sunday night, this past Sunday show, we'll have that in audio podcast form. I'll upload that today sometime. Okay, we'll upload that today. All right, and um, we have the, um, also you can register for the online courses that I teach. Um, we have them all on demand. And they're at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We have them in a bundle pack, a 10 course bundle pack. Uh, they're on sale $60, regularly $130. And uh, it, it includes ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. That is a 14 hour, seven session online course that I teach the, uh, this all on demand, watch at your own pace. And the 10 course bundle pack is regularly $130 on sale, $60, okay? All right, so look, hey, we have to get out of here. Remember at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win Wakanda forever. We'll talk to you next time, peace. <laughs>